Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning. It is good to be here with you today. I'm glad that you're at worship as we celebrate God and his love together. My voice is, um, I think I overdid it in Bible class this morning. And if you watch Bible class, you'll probably know why. So you're going to have to excuse me today if I sound a little bit hoarse. If you're watching us on Facebook, I'm glad that you're here with us too. God bless you. And if you could comment, we'll celebrate your presence with us as well. Our order of service is outlined for you in the worship folder that you receive. We'll be following that this morning. Let's begin by standing up and saying good morning to one another. our worship. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God. Uh, most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Hear the word of God. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We'll continue by singing our first hymn today. <clears throat>
be with you and also with you. Let us pray to the Lord. Father in heaven, at the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan River, you proclaimed him your beloved son, and you anointed him with the Holy Spirit. Make all who are baptized in his name faithful in their calling as your children and inheritors with him of eternal life. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We'll continue with the scripture readings for this morning. The first lesson for today is taken from the 43rd chapter of Isaiah, beginning at the first verse. But now, thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you, I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. I give men in return for you, peoples in exchange for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east, and from the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar, and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle lesson for today is taken from the sixth chapter of Romans, beginning at the first verse. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may be abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him, in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the singing of the Alleluia. According to Luke chapter 3, beginning at the 15th verse. Glory to you, O Lord. As the people were in expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ, John answered them all, saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming. The strap of his sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hands to clear his threshing floor and to gather with wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people, but Herod the Tetrarch, who had been reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that Herod had done, added to this to them, and he locked up John in prison. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened, 
and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form, like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. And we'll continue with the next hymn. and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Today's message is based on the gospel reading. I'd like to read again just a few verses at the end of Luke chapter 3. Now when all the people were baptized and when Jesus had also been baptized and was praying the heavens were opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form, like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. This is the word of the Lord. You know, when I was in school a long time ago, in the dark ages, um, I took some philosophy classes, and I used to think, wouldn't be a bad gig to be a philosopher, right? You sit around and you think. I mean, that's your job. I think all the time. I think about what I want to eat next. I think about when I'm going to sleep. I think about what Linda's going to serve me during a Packer game. I'd be a great philosopher. <laughs> but then you realize thinking isn't really what they do. These philosophers, they come up with some weird stuff in their thinking. Uh, there's a reason I'm getting to this. Zeno who's a philosopher 500 years before Jesus, came up with this idea that he called the paradox of progress. And, and I don't know that I quite have it all, but it goes something like this. Imagine that you're going to cross the street, and, and you, you, every step you take is only half the distance of your first step. Okay, so you step off the curb and you take a stride of two feet. So your next step is only going to be one foot. 
And then your next step is only going to be six inches. And it goes on and on and on from there. When we realize that we can half things kind of almost in an infinite number. And Zeno said it's the idea of always progressing, but never arriving where you want to go. Because there's always a little bit more that you can go. It's constant forward progress but you never arrive at a destination. You're always making progress, but you're never getting anywhere. See, maybe we don't think about that when we're walking to the car or walking into the grocery store, but you gotta admit, there are times in our life where we feel like we're caught in Zeno's paradox of progress. Maybe you feel like you're always moving always going somewhere, but never quite arriving. The destination, it's eluding you. Where you want to go, it, it's not a right, you're not arriving there. It's the paradox of progress. In our gospel lesson this morning, in, in the gospel of Luke chapter three, our eyes are directed to the crowd that's gathered on the bank of the Jordan River. They're not there for a picnic. They're not there to enjoy a nice day out by the water. They're described as a people in expectation, people who are waiting for something to happen. In fact, these Israelites gathered on the bank of the Jordan probably would appreciate the frustration in Zeno's paradox of progress because they too were people who always seemed to be progressing but never arriving anywhere. For generations, they had been moving a lot, figuratively and literally, but they never seemed to get where they were really desired to be. It wasn't just a paradox they were in. It was a predicament, you might say. They were the people who felt they were held back by Caesar and by the Roman Empire. They were held back by the abuses of their own kings, the whole uh, line of Herods that had been over them, that instead of being beneficial advocates for their good, had really abused them to further their own self-interest. And if Roman rule, and if these local puppets weren't bad enough now John the baptizer is telling them that the one thing they were holding on to, the one thing that they had hope in, the, the fact of their, their heritage, that they were the children of Abraham, and certainly God would love them and take care of them for that reason. Now John the baptizer is saying, that's not going to get you anywhere. See, they seem to be making progress, but their destination heaven in God's hand, it never seemed to get any closer. In fact, it even seemed to close on that day. They would never get there. This feeling of moving and never arriving. It's not new to the people on the banks of the Jordan River. It's what their fathers and their grandfathers felt. In fact, it goes back generations all the way to that day in the Garden of Eden. That day when the first humans, Adam and Eve, decided that they would rather trust in their own knowledge rather than trust in their creator. That if they only knew everything, they could get to where they wanted to be before they realized that where they were was exactly where they wanted to be. But Adam and Eve quickly realized that what they learned wasn't helpful at all. What they have in your eyes opened, apart from God, it, it wasn't the epiphany that they expected. Instead, death and sin and despair and grief came in. Instead, the, the knowledge came that they could move forward all they wanted to, but they were never going to get to where they wanted to be. Humanity thought, if only we could have enough rules and regulations, then we can make a step toward progress only to find out time after time 
that no matter what rules and regulations were there, they didn't help. They couldn't keep them. Even when those rules and regulations were written in stone by God who created them. Later on, they thought, if we had a strong leader, a, an earthly king, then we'll get to where they wanted to go. But again, there was failure and a heartache. Knowledge had failed them. Rules had failed them. Governments had failed them. These people who are standing on the bank of the Jordan River had a history of movement, but they would never arrived at their destination. The destination of heaven, it seemed just as far away. The destination of being with God, it seemed just as far away as it had always been. Aren't there times when we feel like no matter how hard we try, we just can't get over that last step? No matter how hard we look, we just can't see where we want to go. It seems the harder we try, the shorter our steps. We're stuck in that paradox of progress that Zeno was talking about. We've seen the first hand, the, the failure of human knowledge. We've seen firsthand the failure of human rules and regulations. We've seen the firsthand the failure of human governments to bring us to where we really want to be. And like the people of Israel, like Zeno, we're stuck. We're people in a predicament, endlessly moving and never arriving. And we know that we're powerless to change that. We're powerless to reach the destination. We're powerless to effect a solution because we're sinners. In verse 15 in Luke chapter three, the crowds, they turn their eyes to John the baptizer. Maybe this is the answer. Maybe he's the solution. That's what they mean when they wonder if he'll, he is the Christ. Maybe he's the one who can solve all of our problems. But you know what John says right away, immediately in verse 16? He says, it's not me. In fact, I'm powerless too. I'm not worthy to tie the straps on the sandals of the real Savior. Where's hope? Who can help us? In John's gospel, Jesus says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. The truth is, John the baptizer can't help us. John the apostle can't help us. You and me, we can't help us. Because a broken, sinful human being is powerless to create anything that isn't already here. You can't do it. I can't make dinner at home without the ingredients already being there. I can't expect a greater than human solution if I'm just relying upon human knowledge, human understanding, human rules, human politics, human ability. In fact, I'll always be disappointed. I'll always be moving, but never arriving. But God doesn't let us despair. In verse 21 of John chapter 3, everything changes. Listen to what Luke says. When Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were open. Did you hear that? The heavens are open. The destination is in sight. It's available. Everything that broken humanity has longed for since the time of Adam and Eve, since they were expelled from God's presence in Eden, is suddenly accessible. It's available for the first time. 
real progress is being made for the first time since the fall. And by the way, for all time after this, the destination is reachable. Not because we've done something right or, or the government has done something right, but because God himself has come into the world. The Son of God, fully human. The Son of God, fully divine, is suddenly and now, here and now. It, he's crucified and risen from the dead. He enters into the waters of baptism. And in this man, who's both uh, finite and infinite at the same time, God and his people are brought together. The people in motion reach their destination, not because of their movement, but because God moved to make them his own. A voice comes from heaven. You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. Jesus Christ, God's own son, verified by the voice of the father himself, to be the only perfect, infinite human worthy of the perfect, infinite destination because he's the creator of that destination. Now, Jesus Christ opens up heaven to him because it belongs to him and to you and to me because he loves us and makes us his own. And that destination is available in our baptism just like it was in Christ's baptism. His baptism makes that progress possible for you and for me. Because the Son of God, uh, the, the Word made flesh, in a miraculous way, comes to us through that water to make us His own. He meets us in our baptism so that heaven is open to you and to me as well. In that baptism, our sinful, fallen humanity it is killed with Jesus on the cross. And in that same water, Jesus resurrects us up, creates in us a new life, a new hope, a new person to stand in front of him, to receive infinite life. Do you not know that all who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Paul would write later to the Romans. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. In our baptism, the infinite God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has from outside of ourselves, from outside of our reality, reached out and brought us to himself miraculously brought us to the destination that we've been striving for for so long and so futilely. St. Paul would say, as many of you as were baptized into Christ, put on Christ. So today, as we celebrate the baptism of Jesus, today, as we celebrate Jesus uh, walking into the Jordan and John pouring the water over his head and the Father and the Spirit joining together to celebrate and acknowledge him as the Son of God, today we can rejoice because of what we have received. Because in our baptism, the power of God's Son, his word, has brought us to the destination. He's carried us to where he is. He's granted us the assurance of heaven, even as we admit our own helplessness and powerlessness. He's reached into the paradox of progress and finally brought us to the other side. It's like those times when we were kids. You remember? You're out somewhere doing something and finally, exhausted, you fall asleep. And what happens the next morning? You wake up in your own bed. You don't remember going there or getting there. You probably always assumed you would end up there. But it was your father who picked you up and carried you home, laid you in your bed. And so our Heavenly Father 
does the same thing for you and for me too. We don't get there on our own. The journey's not our effort, it's his effort. In his love and care, he brings us to our destination. Fear not, the Father says to us in our Old Testament reading today from Isaiah. Fear not, for I've redeemed you. I've called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned and the flames will not consume you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. The paradox of progress, it's no more because we've arrived. It's so we're on the other side because God has brought us home through the waters, the waters of our baptism, even as he has promised. Amen. May the peace of Christ that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in true faith unto life everlasting. Amen. Having heard God's word and the promise of Jesus, we respond by confessing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. If you're able, would you stand and join me as we confess our faith together? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and he sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. For thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Having heard God's promise and call that we are with him, we feel uh, empowered to carry our needs and wishes to him in our prayers. As in your worship folder, there's a prayer list so you can take this out, take it home, keep it by your devotions so that you can include these prayers in your life every day. Let us pray to the Lord. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Dear Jesus, there are times when we, like the people on the banks of the Jordan River, feel like a people waiting for something to happen. We feel like a people always in progress, but never arriving. And we wonder, we worry, we're scared, will ever get to where we want or even where we need to go. We feel like we could move forward if we had enough rules, enough regulations to get us there, and we've made and trusted in plenty of both. But we quickly realize that even then we could not follow you, not even when those rules are engraved in stone by you yourself. For we have failed, we have sinned, we have turned aside, each one to his own way. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And then, St. Luke writes, when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were open. The heavens are open. The destination is in sight. And everything that we have longed for since we were broken in the Garden of Eden is suddenly accessible and available for the first time since the fall and for all time from now on you have called us uh, we, you have brought us to be where you are the son of god fully human yet fully divine is crucified and risen from the dead and through baptism provides us 
with the answer. The, the Son of God remains in the water of baptism and, and, and brings us so that we might meet him in our baptism as well. Come down to us again today. Rekindle this new life in our, in our soul through your word and by your spirit and, and give us the peace and the knowledge of knowing that you have laid us uh, in bed in your home, in our home that we have reached the destination that we so desperately need. Lord, in your mercy, God of love, deliver the sick from their illnesses, give relief to the suffering, help the troubled to know peace of mind and be with the grieving and those in their final days. Give patience to those who must bear with infirmities or disabilities. Especially today, O oh Lord, we name those before you that are in our lives and on our, our minds. We pray for Kathy, Brian, Bill, Mary, Michael, James, Larry, Leah, Ron, Danielle, Ray, Isaac, Harold, Amber, and Andrew, for Steve and Latonya, for Matt and Steve, for Ron, Barbara, Jean, Noah, and Dick, for Sam and Dave, for William and Allison, for Robin and Lance and Ronald, and all those that we name before you in our own hearts and minds, even at this time. Oh Lord Jesus, you know their needs, their worries, their fears, their problems. We ask that you would be with them. If it be your will, grant them health and healing, strength and recovery. But above all, remind them that they're not alone, that you are by their side, that they've arrived at their destination not by their own ability or might, but by your love, grace, and mercy. Oh Lord, give them the confidence to know that in all things, you are by their side, so they do not need to be afraid. Lord, in your mercy, Almighty God, merciful Father, your thoughts are not our thoughts, and your ways are not our ways. We pray for people suffering from disasters and catastrophes. We pray for the families affected by fires in Colorado and throughout our nation. Lord, keep them from despair and do not let their faith fail them. Deliver any who are still in danger and bring hope and healing that they may find relief and restoration. Assure them of your presence and love and give them hope and safety. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear us, O Lord, and give answer to the prayers of your people. Pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who with the Father and the Spirit, you are one God and one Lord forevermore. Amen. Hear us as we pray the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And receive the blessing that God gives to you, not just today, but every day in your life, by his grace, through his presence. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Let's close by singing our last hymn today. Go tell it on the mountain. <clears throat>
what a blessing it is to gather together and know that God is here in the midst of us. And I know that's true because I look around and I see you. And God is in your life as well. Thank you for joining us and worshiping with us today. Both those of you who are here in person and if you're watching us online, God bless you and know that he is with you this morning as well. It's his promise. He has brought us to where he is right now. A um, couple of things to remind you about before I let you go. Of course, first we want to celebrate with those who are celebrating. And this week, Pam is our birthday celebration. Pam and Don did it right. They both have birthdays in one week, so they get it all over right away. Let's wish happy birthday to them. Couple of things to remind you about. Um, today, right after coffee fellowship time, which by the way, you're invited to, it's like lunch here, you can skip going out to eat. Um, right after that, the church council meets. So if you're on the council, stay for that. Um, I had a note about the poinsettias, but we got it all taken care of. So you don't have to worry about that today. Bible classes continue this week. So we have Bible class, a women's class on Tuesday morning. It meets in the uh, choir room. Wednesday is not meeting this week. That one's online, but we are still on hold um, as Linda and I will be traveling for my dad's funeral. Uh, but next Sunday, we continue our study of the book of Esther, and that's here at the church. It starts at 9 o'clock, and you can also follow that. Uh, on Facebook if you would like to. So join us for the book of Esther and find out why I can't talk today, I guess. Um, the Little Free Pantry. Okay, we need volunteers uh, the months of February and March uh, to, to fill the pantry. The sign-up sheets are on the blue table in the entryway, along with by the way, a lot of other areas of ministry that you can get involved in and help out. We need people on the camera and ushers and communion assistants and altar and all those kind of things. You can find all that information on the blue table and be a part of our walk together in that way. In the Little Free Pantry food, we are low right now. We're totally out of peanut butter and jelly, a canned tuna and chicken, all the little Chef Boyardee canned meals and chilies, um, and everything else is low except perhaps vegetables and, and beans. Um, so if you could bring those in, uh, I appreciate it. Remember always, uh, no glass jars uh, or glass containers, uh, we don't want them to be dropped out there by people and then leaving shards, you know, where they can hurt themselves at. Um, so bring in food for the, the Little Free Pantry. I talked about this Circle of Love um, fundraiser before. I'm not going to go through it today. There, this card is on the blue table if you want more information, except to remind you again that when it says it's at Lake Oconee Church, that's not our church. So the Lake Oconee Church is the church that, that's up the road, up 44, just a little ways um, south of Cafe 44 and north of the eye doctor, kind of in that area. So if you're planning to go to this fundraiser, don't come here for that, okay? Um, and I already said, all the sign-ups are on the blue table. You can be a part of our life together um, by signing up. And remember, what did Mordecai say to Esther? Those of you who are here this morning, who knows if you were put here in this place for such a time as this. God uses you. He uses me to accomplish his work in ways that we don't anticipate and maybe don't even recognize. But he uses us nonetheless. Okay? God bless you and keep you this week. Uh, hopefully we'll see each other when he pulls us again together soon. Uh, stay for coffee and fellowship. Stay for the council meeting if you're on council. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Amen. Amen.